Good morning, everyone. Thanks, Walter, for that introduction. And thank you all for being here. So today I'm going to be talking about how we can use CRISPR-Cas9 to characterize thousands of variants in the human genome all at once. And I'm a graduate student in Jason Dury's lab at the University of Washington, where I just want to point out it's 1.30 in the morning right now. So if I'm a little sleep deprived up here, uh, be easy on me. OK, so I think as all of us in the room know, variants of uncertain significance are a huge problem in genetics today. Uh, Leah Sturita, who's in my lab, made this plot of the 56 genes that the ACMG has deemed clinically actionable. And what the plot is showing on the x-axis is the number of registered tests for each gene, and on the y-axis is the number of missense variants that are in ClinVar. So the point of this is that as there's more and more genetic testing done, we see more and more missense variants, which leads to a higher rate of variants of uncertain significance, which is represented by the size of each circle. So for some of these genes, BRCA1 and BRCA2, for instance, there's over 1,000 variants of uncertain significance in ClinVar. So given this uh, huge task at hand of how do we interpret all this variation that we're finding, we have different methods at our disposal. One of them is classical genetics, which of course is very powerful if you have enough uh, patient samples to, to uh, see how a trait uh, associates within families. And we know that the results we get from that are highly accurate. Other approaches uh, that have come along the last 10 years rely on computational prediction to predict the effect of a given variant uh, on function. And these approaches, of course, are kind of the opposite in that they're extremely high in throughput. You can compute uh, a given variant's effect across the entire genome, but the validity is something that still needs improvement. And then today what I'm going to focus on is how we can actually uh, do functional assays. And this is another great way to actually test a variant's effect. And traditionally, these have uh, been pretty valid, but the throughput's been limiting. And as we sequence more and more people, uh, we, we have more and more variants to test, and we simply can't keep up with the current methods out there. Okay, so this is the workflow for how a functional asset usually goes, and many of you, I'm sure, have done something like this in your own labs. So you observe genetic variation in a patient sample, and then you clone that variation in some form into constructs that you can assay to measure functional effects. Now, in our lab, we like to do multiplex functional assays. So this is a version of the same thing, but instead of starting with just a few samples, we start with any number, in some cases tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands of different variants. And what makes all this possible is next generation sequencing. We can uh, produce a very large library of variants using different mutagenesis methods, and then perform some sort of functional assay that sorts out variants uh, by the effect that they have, and sequence large pools uh, to, to see how each variant is performing the assay. And I'll go into this in more detail soon. But the point I want to make here is that when we take these variants out of their genomic context, we're losing a lot of information. And so here I'm showing a, a plasmid schematic. And if we have a, a given variant on a plasmid, think about it. We've taken it out of the native genomic context where it's spliced, and it, expression is regulated tightly, uh, and, and we're, we're losing all that information there. So there's some question of how valid assays are when they're performed on plasmids. And I think um, now that we're starting to have better tools for genome engineering, we're going to figure out exactly uh, what, where the discrepancies lie. So luckily, this is 2017. And with CRISPR-Cas9, we can start to test variants in their native context in the genome. And what I'm showing here is a schematic of a uh, CRISPR-Cas9 system. So uh, the Cas9 protein is this uh, kind of ghost-like uh, structure here. And the Cas9 protein. Uh, complexes with a guide RNA, which is represented by the green and red strand here of nucleotides. And the way Cas9 works in the genome is first the Cas9 protein binds and recognizes what's called a PAM sequence or a protospacer adjacent motif. And the, the cool feature about this is that it's only three nucleotides long. So there's um, very many PAM sequences. If you guys know that the PAM sequence for the most common Cas9 is NGG. And that occurs uh, all over the genome, essentially. So there's very many places we can target. And then what makes CRISPR specific is the RNA component, the guide RNA, we call it. And it requires this RNA component to bind the DNA for cutting to ensue. And uh, so we call this an RNA-guided endonuclease. And this also is what allows CRISPR to work so efficiently. To change where the Cas9 protein cuts in the genome, all you have to do is clone a new guide RNA and because it's a direct correspondence between the RNA and the genomic DNA site that we're cutting, 
It's as simple as ordering an oligo and cloning it. So this allows us to rapidly generate up to hundreds or even thousands of guide RNAs and large guide RNA libraries targeting all over the genome. And this is what really sets Cas9 apart from previous genome editing technologies such as talons and zinc fingers, if you're familiar with those. Okay, so at the end of all this, we get a double strand break if the PAM sequence is present and the homology between the guide RNA and the genomic DNA is sufficient, and we get cleavage in a highly specific fashion in the genome. So for any functional assay where you want to engineer a variant, you have to start with getting your CRISPR-Cas9 into the cells. And depending on what exactly your goals are, there's different methods to do this. I'm going to talk about how to do this, uh, what the options are for cell culture systems. One that uh, I use most commonly is a plasmid transfection. And so we make plasmids that express both a Cas9 and a guide RNA in the same plasmid, and often a selectable marker such as a pyromycin resistance gene or a GFP cassette. And this is a really quick and easy system to get uh, a simple knockout in a cell line uh, and measure its effects. But we can also express Cas9 and guide RNAs uh, from lentivirus or adenovirus systems. And this is a nice method if you want to get permanent integration of your Cas9 system into the cells. And if you don't want to do any cloning whatsoever, you can actually just order Cas9 as a protein and synthetic RNA components, guide RNAs, complex them uh, in vitro and then directly transfect those into cells and get a knockout that way without doing any cloning whatsoever. So this is what really makes um, it, this such a, a widely used approach today is that you don't have to do very much to, to change where you're targeting the genome. You just order a different guide RNA and it targets somewhere entirely new. Okay, so once you get your CRISPR-Cas9 into the cells, it makes a double-strand break in the genomic DNA, which I'm representing here. And that break is going to be repaired uh, in one of two pathways. And the first one is non-homologous end joining, or NATJ. And this is the pathway that you use if you want to make a uh, deletion or an insertion. So the other pathway by which the cells will repair a break and lead to an editing event is homology directed repair, or HDR. And this is how you incorporate a new allele into the genome of your choosing. So in this case, you actually provide a template that has homology to the site you're cutting at and then the cell's uh, homologous recombination proteins will integrate that template into the genome. So if you want to, say, put in a GFP allele or a certain variant that you see in a patient population, you can engineer it that way. So to go over how these two pathways have been used to model uh, the effect of editing the genome uh, on cells, I'm going to divide kind of the, this next slide in half. So for one, if you want to make just a knockout, uh, non-homologous end joining is really efficient because the deletions or insertions are most likely going to be frame shifting and you can isolate either a clonal population of cells or an animal that has a, a disruptive mutation that will cause loss of function of that allele. And additionally, because it's so simple um, to order large libraries of guide RNAs these days, people have uh, adopted this approach to screen a large number of genes at once. So these pooled guide RNA screens they might clone up to 100,000 guide RNAs or even more into a single library where one guide RNA corresponds to every gene in the genome. So you can use these libraries to actually knock out every gene in a single experiment. Uh, and to kind of illustrate how we've used this approach in our lab and work by uh, Molly Gasparini, who's another grad student, uh, we wanted to use guide RNAs to knock out potential enhancer elements. So in this schematic I'm setting up here, we have the HPRT1 locus. And we want to know if this little segment in red here is potentially an enhancer. I've blown it up for you here. And we're not actually using one guide RNA construct. We're using two. So we're going to cut twice, once on this end and once on this end of this putative enhancer. But not only are we going to knock out this one, because it's so um, uh, uh, easy to synthesize multiple guide RNAs, we can actually make thousands of deletions in a single experiment. So what we did is we put two guide RNAs into cells uh, and used combinations of two to make all these deletions in red I'm showing you on bottom, over 4,000 deletions at all that we programmed in a single experiment. And then our results are this track in blue, and HPRT1 is a gene that confers 6 thioguanine when it is knocked out. So we were looking for elements that disrupted HPRT1 function and therefore would score in our assay, which is what's reflected by the blue peaks here. And really all we found, if you look at the blue peaks, they all correspond to exons in the gene. So despite the fact that we knocked out uh, 4,000 different deletions, and we have these nice exons as controls to make sure we're actually making these deletions, we didn't find a single enhancer that actually regulated HPRT1. 
which might not be all that surprising if you guys know HBRT1 biology, it's a housekeeping gene, so it might not necessarily have very many enhancers regulating its expression. So yeah, really only this proximal promoter region is where we had some deletions that seem to impact upon gene function. Okay, so going back to our schematic about how we repair double-strand breaks in the genome, I just talked about how non-homologous end-joining can be used to create deletions and insertions, and we can do that in a very high throughput approach with, with CRISPR technologies now. But the pathway I'm going to be talking more about today is the homology directed repair pathway, and as I told you before, this is the pathway we use to engineer specific alleles. So in this schematic, uh, we transfect our cells with CRISPR and then a repair template. You can use either a plasmid that has homology or a short oligo sequence that has homology to the site you're cutting. And through homology, uh, homologous recombination, we integrate that variant into the genome. So the real question um, and the difficulty with this is that if we have genetic testing that leads to hundreds of new variants every day, how do we possibly keep up testing all those variants? So ideally we have a way to scale this approach to be able to engineer uh, more than just one variant in cells at once, and, and much like I showed you down here with the pooled guide RNA screens, actually assay all those variants in a single population. So this is the work that I've been doing uh, throughout graduate school, and it's culminated in a method that we call saturation genome editing. And the premise of this is that we make every possible single nucleotide variant at a single locus. And the way this is possible is that we multiplex the HDR process. So instead of using a single variant to repair a double strand break, we provide a library of different mutations that all will be incorporated in the genomes of cells and culture. So this HDR library, uh, every molecule in it is similar in that it has homology arms that allow for the homologous recombination to occur once you make a cut, but they're different in that each different uh, plasmid in the library has a different variant, and we can do hundreds to thousands. Really what limits us here is the length at which a gene conversion tract happens in the genome. So when the HDR process occurs, uh, efficiencies tend to drop once you're more than about 100 bases away. So usually we only make every possible mutation in about 100 base region. And then to actually clone all these variants into a single library, we can order them as oligos that are synthesized on a microarray to generate all this diversity. Now I want to point out there'd be other ways to do that as well if you use air prone PCR, uh, or, or different cloning methods that will give you variants uh, in your population. Okay, so the effect of this, once we have our library, is that we can create a population of edited cells where each cell has a different variant that we programmed to generate in the cells. And then we take our cells and we'll apply some sort of functional selection to them, such as uh, in this schematic, we're treating the cells, the drug, that causes some of them, this orange cell here, to be depleted from the population. Now at this point, all these cells are together in a single dish, so we don't actually know what each variant is doing. So the only way to actually get at that is to use amplicon sequencing to very deeply sequence the site that we're editing to see how each variant is impacting function. And to do that, we sequence both the population of cells before drug treatment to measure which variants made it into the genome, and then a population of cells after drug treatment to actually get quantitative effects on what that selection did to each variant. And from this, we get some sort of functional score. Okay, so I want to point out to actually assay thousands of var variants like this in a multiplex fashion, we're testing them all at once, it requires a lot of cells. But it's actually not that hard to grow that many cells if you think about it. it it's, um, it's, it's reasonable to culture millions of cells, and then if we transfect enough cells with Cas9 and get HDR rates high enough, they actually get millions of cells that are edited variants, and then when we sequence them, it's trivial now to get millions of sequencing reads of a single locus. So although these numbers are high, to get the noise down these experiments, uh, it's all readily attainable with modern technologies. Okay, so the different assays that we've used uh, the system on so far include splicing, and this is an example of a molecular assay, so we're not actually applying a selection to the cells, but we're just sequencing uh, RNA to see how each variant is, is faring in the RNA population. Then there's also cellular assays, such as cell fitness or how the cells respond to drug treatment, as I showed you in this example here. So uh, back in 2014 when we published a proof of concept on this method, we wanted to pick a gene to demonstrate on where we know uh, what the effects of the gene would be. And for that we picked this gene DBR1, which is an essential gene, meaning that cells cannot proliferate in cell culture uh, when it's knocked out. And that was shown actually using CRISPR screens. It was one of the, the highest scoring genes in those CRISPR screens with pooled guide RNA libraries. DBR1 is an intron lariat debranchase, meaning it 
uh, cleaves intron lariats so they can be processed further for degra degradation. And like I said, without that function, the cells will accumulate lariats and eventually die. And in our preliminary library here, what we generated were uh, 75 single nucleotide variants across every, um, it, it turned out to be uh, every nucleotide of a, of a 75 base pair stretch of an exon at DBR1. So we're making exonic mutations here. We're going to see both synonymous effects, missense effects, and nonsense effects. And what we get at the end of experiment is a map like this. And I know this is too small to read, but what it is is we're showing a, an enrichment score for each variant across the entire region we mutate. And let's just zoom in on one area so you can see it better. So this is just the start, the first uh, 17 nucleotides of the region we mutated. And there's going to be three bars for each position here because there's three different possible substitutions we can make at each site. And the bars that are colored green correspond to missense variants. The ones that are colored orange, nonsense, there's only three of those, here, here, and here. And the ones that are pink are synonymous variants. And as we see, we get a kind of a wide range of scores here when we plot our enrichment scores, meaning how well a cell survived once the variant is present uh, on the y-axis. So if this point, for instance, scored really poorly, indicating that the variant represented by this dot had a negative effect on the cells. And this is a missense variant, so that's how we read these. And going back a slide, we see we have these scores for the entire region here. So this is uh, 225 mutations that we're, we're sequencing in this single experiment. And by and large, the effects that we're seeing make sense in that missense uh, variants tend to have varied effects. Some of them, like I showed you here, are depleted, whereas other ones don't have any effect at all. Uh, the synonymous mutations we made are in pink, and those tend to have very small effects, which is consistent with the fact they wouldn't be affecting protein structure and therefore not function. Then all three of the nonsense uh, variants we put in in this assay were strongly depleted against, which is confirming that this is in fact an essential gene. When you make a nonsense mutation, the cells die out. Okay, so the other thing, if we zoom back out, uh, there, you, know, you see certain trends in the data. So looking at the whole map here, there's this region on the far left that I've highlighted where every possible missense variant causes loss of function. We see a strong depletion of those variants in the population. And that makes sense to us because we know that this region actually encodes for the active site of the DBR1 protein. So it makes sense that it's very intolerant to missense mutations. So these are the kind of effects that you see looking across uh, a large region like this, making all these uh, mutations in a single batch. Okay, so with that proof of concept done, that kind of concludes the first part of what I'm going to be talking about today, which is how we use CRISPR uh, to rapidly engineer genetic variation and then assay that variation. And I'm going to focus more uh, on new data that I haven't ever talked about before, so this will be fun. Um, using CRISPR to actually make thousands of mutations in BRCA1 and assay them all together. Okay, so what are some methods by which we can assay BRCA1 function in human cells? Of course, this is a question that is highly relevant to, to clinical sub-studies. I showed you at the start, there's now over a thousand different missense mutations that have been uh, clinically sequenced in BRCA1. And the gold standard in the field right now is to use HDR reporter assays. And these are assays that work by having a cell population with a broken GFP in it that can only be repaired uh, by having BRCA1 participate in the homology-directed repair process, which will convert that GFP from being broken to active, and therefore the cells will turn green. So this is one viable approach to assay BRCA1 function. But we think there's another method to do it as well, and that's cell viability. So like I showed you with the DBR1 example, is often these mutations will actually kill the cells if, if you make a mutation in an essential gene. And in a lot, of, a lot of cell lines, BRCA1 is not essential. You can dispose of the homologous recombination pathway that BRCA1 is critical to, and the cells don't die. But there are PARP inhibitors you can use to make cells more uh, sensitive to BRCA1 knockout. And... Uh, we actually didn't end up using those, though, because this paper came out in 2015 uh, that did a, did a genome-wide screen using a gene trap method to identify genes that are essential for human cells to proliferate in culture. And surprisingly to us, one of the genes they found was BRCA1. Uh, it was crucial for these haploid cells they used in their screen to grow in culture. And I want to point out, they do this screen in haploid cells because there's only one copy of every gene. So even though you only target, uh, you get one gene trap event per cell, because there's no second allele, that, that event, you're still going to see the effects of that in your assay. So this is the system we decided to, to try to use to assay BRC1 function. And the first thing we want to do is just confirm that in our hands, if we target BRC1 with CRISPR, we see the same effect. 
So what I'm showing you here is a schematic of the BRCA1 gene. Uh, all the exons are boxes. And we designed a guide RNA that cuts in a single exon of BRCA1. And here we're not doing any homologous, uh, homologous recombination. We're not integrating any variants in. We're just relying on a non-homologous end joining to create indels via the CRISPR cutting. So what we see is after a week of culture, when we transfect in a control that targets HPRT1, we see the cells all grow fine. But when we target CRISPR this BRCA1 site, the dish is virtually empty of cells. The cells that are there look fine, but over 90% of them are dead. So this shows two things. For one, when we, when we actually knock out BRCA1, the cells are dying, so that confirms that. But additionally, this is really showing how highly active CRISPR-Cas9 constructs are in the cells. There's not so many cells that are left here because every cell is getting edited, and there's a high proportion of frame shift mutations that are happening, and therefore the cells are dying out. So to confirm that this effect wasn't uh, due to some sort of off-target of CRISPR, uh, we actually went to the site we cut at and sequenced the indels there. And sure enough, after the cells grow out for a while, there's a much higher proportion of uh, full-length, unedited cells. And the indels that we initially see are dropping out because they're all dying, presumably. Okay, so this confirms that, sure enough, BRCA1 is essential for these haploid human cells we have to grow. So now we set out to actually test uh, all possible SNBs across the gene that could possibly be impactful. Um, and I think it would be really hard to test all the possible SNBs that could be impactful, so we wanted to find a way to prioritize which ones we should focus on first. So BRC1 is a pretty big gene. It spans 81 kilobases in the genome, and it produces a transcript that's over 5,000 bases long, and a protein of 800, or sorry, 1,863 amino acids. And like I've been telling you, BRCA1 is critical for double-strand break repair by homologous recombination, or HDR. And it's thought that this HDR activity is what tracks really closely with um, how BRCA1 variants contribute to cancer risk for breast and ovarian cancer. And the two domains of the protein that are really important for that are the ring domains, uh, the ring domain, which spans exons two through five, and then two BRCT domains at the c terminus of the protein, spanning exons 15 through 23. So missense mutations in these two domains have been linked to uh, hereditary forms of breast and ovarian cancer predisposition. So we thought these would be the right domains to start with, and that they're kind of the high-priority high regions of the protein that are known to be of functional importance. And this is 13 exons in total that we wanted to, to create all possible variants in. So let me show you how we do this, uh, one exon at a time. We can't make him uh, cut in exon four here and integrate a uh, variant in exon 17, so we have to design for each exon a guide RNA that targets the exon. And then, like I showed you before, a library for homologous recombination that has all the different variants we want in it. So in this case, it would be one variant at every position across the exon. I'm only showing you three here. But I want to highlight that we're not only targeting the exons, we're also going into the splice junctions here, which is critical, as you know, for human genetics to have, uh, there's often variants that can affect splicing, uh, not just two, but maybe 10, 10 bases or more into the exon. So we want to be able to assay all those variants as well. Okay, so we have to clone a library like this and a guide RNA for all the exons that we want to target. So 13 in total here. Which means for the graduate student, which is me doing the experiments, there's 13 large dishes of cells in culture. And uh, across those 13 dishes, though, we're engineering a total of about 4,000 different variants in a single experiment at once. And it's a lot to handle, but it, it's not more than you can do in a couple weeks. So this is a really rapid way to generate all these variants uh, in the system. Okay, so to walk you through how the experiment goes, first we, we clone the library for a given exon. I'm representing here with this blue box around the exon. Uh, and then we're going to let the cells, after we do the editing, grow out for five days. Then we take a baseline sample there where the editing has occurred. And for this given exon, we see an HDR rate of about 20%, meaning 20% of the cells get a variant from our library. And then we let the cells continue to grow for another six days, over which time the variants that are disruptive to BRC1 function drop out from the pool. And these are just histograms showing the distribution of all possible variants. So we see a nice normal distribution here in our library that all variants are present in the, in the plasmid library we're using to repair the cuts in the cells. Then on day five, all the variants are making in the genome, which is encouraging. Then the distribution on day 11 is a bit more shifted because variants start to drop out and they shift left here. So another way to technically kind of assess the quality by which we're introducing these variants is to look at how readily we see 
each single nucleotide variant in the day five pool. So here what I'm showing is a correlation across two different replicates, and the correlation is quite high, 0 .9, uh, 0.96 in this case, indicating that we're robustly integrating the variants into the genome on day five in a reproducible manner. And of course, these variants, uh, because we know exactly where they lie, they all have different functions. So for the rest of the talk, I'm going to color code each dot, which represents a single variant on the plot, by its predicted co uh, consequence on protein structure. It's a missense mutation, a synonymous mutation, or an intronic mutation, uh, non-sensor splice site. And I'm grouping the synonymous and intronic variants together uh, in, this, in this blue color. Okay, so what we really care about, if we want to assay all these variants at once, is this enrichment score. And how we define that is the day 11 abundance of a variant divided by the day five abundance. So this is a measure of how the variant has fared in culture over the six days of selection. And if we want to ask, are we actually uh, measuring effects that are real here, we can really simply check how do the nonsense variants compare uh, with the synonymous variants. Okay. Missing a plot here. Uh, sorry about that. <laughs> if the plot was here, there'd be a nice separation between the missense, uh, sorry, the nonsense and the synonymous peak. And... Uh, you know, let's, let's just go forward a slide here. Sorry about that. So, um, so, so this is the same distribution, but I'm showing each variant as a, as a dot here. And uh, it's harder because it's not plotted the same way, but, but you can see kind of this bimodal distribution where there are a lot of variants uh, that score fa uh, fairly positively because they're being selected for over time. And then a second pool that score fairly negatively because they're being selected against over time. And uh, this plot I'm actually showing here now is correlating each variant's effect in our assay on the x-axis, the enrichment score, to the variant's CAD score. So many of you may be familiar with CAD scores. Uh, this is an approach that Martin Kircher in our lab developed to computationally predict the effect of each variant, uh, how deleterious it will be. So we, we expect variants that have high CAD scores, such as all these nonsense variants up here in red, the CAD scores are 40 or above for these, to be pretty deleterious. And sure enough, that's what we see. They all have low enrichment scores. So overall, if we were to draw a line here dividing the variants that were selected for from the variants that were selected against, we can kind of separate them out into these two pools. And there is a correlation here that's being driven largely by a large proportion of synonymous variants that are positively selected. They're having no effects. So the cells keep living and end up winning out in culture versus variants that are nonsense and are being depleted over time. And then I want to point out, we're also assaying uh, the canonical splice variants, which are shown here in yellow, and sure enough, all those are depleted as well. So the overall correlation for this data is negative 0.42, which is say higher CAD scores predict that the variants will perform more poorly in, in, their, in our assay, which is what we're seeing here. So 0.42 is a, a kind of a, it's a reasonable correlation, it makes sense, but I want to highlight that the, the computational ways we can predict variants are imperfect. And if we only look at the missense variants, which are highlighted here in green, we see this separation, where the correlation isn't very good, only 0.22 uh, between variants that are depleted and enriched. And you don't see much of a trend here looking at the actual data, even though the missense variants are pretty bimodally distributed between ones that are selected for and ones that are selected against. Also, you may have noticed that there's a fair number of variants that don't actually change the protein sequence at all, uh, but they still have negative effects. So we presume these must be having effects on transcript abundance uh, if they're dropping out of our assay like this. So I'll talk more about that in a second. Okay, so ultimately what we want to do with each of these variants is map them back to their location in the genome, like I showed you before, and make a sequence function map. And so here we're going to have their chromosome 17 position on the x-axis, and because the RSA1 is on the negative strand, this is, this is flipped, so the direction of transcription is going uh, from right to left here and I'm going to plot the enrichment of the variant on the y-axis. What we get is a plot like this for a single experiment where we engineered 300 variants at once in culture. And again, it's the same color coding scheme I showed you before. So some trends to point out. First of all, we see that there are positional effects for some of the missense variants. For instance, in this region right in the middle of the exon, almost every missense variant we make causes loss of function, which is reflected by the low enrichment scores. Whereas for the synonymous and intronic variants that aren't actually changing the protein sequence at all, we see that variants uh, near the exon junction tend to be the ones that are, that are impacting function. 
And again, so the yellow here is the canonical splice site, so just two nucleotides. And then uh, if we go further in here uh, into the intron, some of those variants tend to have low scores as well, presumably because they're affecting splicing. Whereas the synonymous variants that lie within the exon, we see uh, much, much less depletion. Okay, so I just want to zoom in on this one region, right, of this exon intron boundary. And what we see is, uh, so this is kind of the, the plot. And um, again, I'm showing enrichment score on the y-axis and each variance effect on the x-axis here. And we see that it's not only the two bases that are canonical splice uh, mutations that have low effects, but seven bases into the intron, almost every possible SNV causes loss of function of BRCA1 in our assay. So this really highlights something that we can do with genome editing that we can't do with other assays in the sense that by making these mutations in the genome where they're going to be spliced, we can get at effects like this you would not be able to get at if you made this mutation, say, on a cDNA construct, because it's a lot harder to assay splicing. Okay, so you might be wondering out there, why do we have some synonymous variants that score, score lowly? And we do have four in our assay that scored pretty lowly. And presumably, maybe these are affecting splicing too. There could be exonic splice elements that are required for BRCA1 to be spliced. So what we want to do is actually look at the mRNA levels of these variants. And for that, we took the same population of cells that we did our experiments on, and we simultaneously purified both genomic DNA and RNA from the cells. So now instead of getting an enrichment score that reflects selection, we're going to get an enrichment score that reflects expression. We just take the ratio of RNA to the ratio of genomic DNA for each variant, and that tells us how the variant is affecting the gene's expression. So what we get is a plot that looks like this, where I've lined it up. So here's the RNA expression plot on bottom, and the genomic DNA enrichment, so the selective effects of the variant on the top. And sure enough, for those variants that were synonymous and caused loss of function, three of the four drop out strongly from the RNA pool, indicating that they are, in fact, expressing, uh, impacting the RNA function. Now, oddly, this fourth one, uh, which is scored as being, uh, sorry, down here, is scored as being highly deleterious every time we run this experiment, doesn't have an effect on RNA levels at all. So presumably this is acting somehow on the translational level. Uh, we really don't know. This is a molecular mystery at this point, why it's dropping out, but it's been a consistent effect. Okay, so if we think about um, what this means, as a synonymous variant drops below a certain level of expression, it starts to become a loss of function variant. So we think it's a sort of a threshold for how much expression is required for function to occur in these cells. If we draw that threshold here, we notice that it's not just the synonymous variants that drop out. Uh, a lot of the nonsense variants are depleted, which makes sense uh, in, ad in adherence to nonsense mediated decay. But there's also a lot of missense variants that are being depleted. And some of these have been annotated as pathogenic in the literature, uh, and people probably presume it's because of a change in protein function, but um, we're seeing here strong effects on, on RNA levels as well. So we, we can't say for sure it's only RNA levels. Uh, it could be a combination of RNA mediated effects and uh, protein structure effects for a missense variant, but I just want to make the point that several missense variants do have strong effects on expression. Okay, so if we look at sequence function relationships for all the 4,000 variants in the pool, like I told you, we're going one gut RNA and one library at a time for 13 exons, uh, the, the data starts to accumulate pretty quickly. So here I'm showing you over 1,000 different variants that we assayed. All in all now, though, we think we've made over 95% of the 4,000 variants that we set out to make. So we're approaching saturation for all 13. But before we go any further, we really want to know, is this actually useful, right? So uh, to get at that, we wanted to ask, do our scores actually correspond to clinical data? So um, we pulled the ClinVar annotations from the ClinVar database for variants that were annotated as being pathogenic or likely pathogenic, uh, benign or likely benign, or of conflicting interpretation or of uncertain significance. Uh, and we want to see how each of those categories is performing in our assay to ask if our assay is representing data uh, that could be useful clinically, possibly in predicting a variant effect. So first just showing you the pathogenic and likely pathogenic variants that are in ClinVar for this one exon. Uh, all 24 of them were strongly depleted in our assay, and I'm showing that by indicating the variants with the red bar here. So many of them are nonsense mutations like this, others are missense mutations, and these are things that, again, have been seen in ClinVar and are predicted to be pathogenic. So it's reassuring to us that they're dropping out in our assay. So thinking about uh, where we might want to draw a threshold to, to say a variant is associated with pathogenicity, uh, again, this is 
pretty arbitrary at this point. We need to do this much more rigorously going forward. But we can draw a, a tentative threshold right here uh, where all the pathogenic variants fall below that. And referring to us, nonsense variants that haven't actually been seen in ClinVar, but that we would predict to be pathogenic, also fall below that threshold. Again, just showing the assays producing information that we believe to be accurate. Okay, so if you look at benign variants, there's only one. It's a missense variant, and sure enough, it scores as uh, not being depleted. And then if we incorporate likely benign variants from ClinVar annotations as well, only two of those 13 are depleted. And both of those are annotated as being likely benign. So to highlight them, there's one here, which is a synonymous variant, and that's the one I talked about where we looked at its expression, and it wasn't affected, so we don't know what's going on with this guy. And then there's another one, this annotate is being likely benign, uh, in, just outside the splice junction here, and the score for this one's more intermediate, kind of right uh, around the threshold we're drawing here. But mostly, most of the variants that are annotated as being likely benign are surely not being depleted in our assay. Okay, so now looking at variants of uncertain significance or of conflicting interpretation in yellow, and I grouped these two categories together, I realize they're not the same, of course, but in our assay, the, the numbers are roughly uh, similar, so I just colored all of them yellow. And we see uh, a split here, 19 of 31 of these are depleted. So this really goes to show the importance here that we could actually answer these, and, and for some of them, the scores are, straight, are quite strong, uh, and all the data is bimodally distributed here, so th this gets at the fact that we can really use this information potentially uh, to, to solve some of these. And then I want to point out that the majority of these variants still have never been seen in a, in a uh, clinical sample. So, and of all those variants, 41% fall below our threshold that we're cutting here. So this is kind of a, if we have a new variant for this particular region of the genome, what is our, our best guess that it's going to be uh, pathogenic if it happens in a patient? Okay, so I want to caveat all this uh, by saying that we have many challenges remaining uh, for how we interpret this data. And I think, first of all, um, from my perspective, doing the experiments, it's very important that we keep optimizing our assay and de generating more data to make these scores more and more confident. There's still more noise than we're really comfortable with. And uh, before we can actually use this to interpret anything clinically, we want to resolve where are our discrepancies with our assay from what's been seen clinically and, and figure out, you know, is it our assay is not accurate? Uh, are we not using the right cell type? Um, and try to figure out where we, where we get accurate information and where we don't going forward. I think ultimately, it's not, um, it's not that assays like this will replace clinical data. It's that we need to find ways to integrate uh, functional assay information in, into the clinical uh, database we already have. Okay, so with those caveats, um, thinking forward, I showed you this plot at the beginning with all the genes that are clinically actionable for which there's now a growing number of variants of uncertain significance. I think the challenge is we have to find the right assay for each variant. Um, so that's going to be a big challenge that all of you guys can contribute to, and that if you're experts on these genes, you should be the ones finding the assay and developing uh, methods like this to, to get at more of these variants of uncertain significance. Okay, so in summary, I've described saturation genome editing to you, uh, which is a way to assay hundreds or even thousands of variants at once. I think going forward, we, we want to keep focusing on generating high-quality data, uh, take this approach to additional loci, and ultimately, uh, we think we can use our data to improve computational tools of prediction uh, and hopefully get at a point where integrating different methods make a more informed clinical decision. So with that, I'd like to thank everyone who helped out with this project, especially my mentor, Jason Dury. Thank you for your attention. I'd be happy to take any questions. Yeah.